Greetings. My name is Chuck Anderson. Since retiring from about 50 years of active church ministry and church planting on the eastern slope of Colorado, I've become the editor of Discovery News. You know, with all the things that are going on in the world today, uh, there seems to be a renewed interest in the book of Revelation in the Bible. And I have to admit to you that I've read Revelation perhaps hundreds of times through the years, but I decided recently that it was time to take a more serious, closer look. And I've been just amazed at the things that I've learned that, that I've never known before. It amazes me that you can be a Christian for 60 years and all of a sudden it seems like the scriptures open up to you and you learn all sorts of new things. And it seems to me that revelation just opens up when you approach it with a hungry heart, a heart that wants to know. <clears throat> so I thought perhaps it's time to uh, put these things on video and up on YouTube and make them available to people all over. There's a lot of questions about Revelation, a lot of confusion, to be, to be honest. But I'm calling the series Unraveling the Mysteries of Revelation. I actually could, could call it something different, like Revelation, plain and simple. Uh, I think that sometimes we make things more complicated than they have to be. And I have asked the Lord to open my eyes, open my heart, open my understanding, because this is a revelation. It's not a hidden book. It's a revelation. A revelation is a very special book. In fact, uh, in chapter 1, verse 3, you read some amazing things, and there's a promise I don't find anywhere else in the Bible. And that promise goes like this. Blessed is he that reads and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is at hand. The word keep, by the way, is the Greek word terrario, and it means to observe carefully or to treasure in your heart. I honestly believe that, that God reveals things to people with hungry hearts. And, uh, and God promises to bless those that read it, hear it, and treasure or keep it in their hearts. The book of Revelation, of course, has fascinated people for centuries. Uh, but the book of Revelation, to many, is filled with all sorts of strange symbols and things they don't understand. I found that the book of Revelation is quite the opposite, actually, because revelation means unveiling. It means removing the blinders, making things visible and understandable. Oh, and by the way, uh, this is not the revelation of St. John the Divine, even if your Bible says that. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus, the God of creation, not created, but eternal, one with the Father, uh, one with the Spirit, part of the triune Godhead. Uh, Jesus is our Redeemer. And he told the Apostle Paul, uh, the Apostle John, to write the things that he revealed to him. Uh, Patmos is where John was living. He was a uh, enemy of the state of Rome, of Rome and uh, sent to the prisoner island of, of Patmos. Not a very happy place to be. It's got some beaches and the water is beautiful, but it's pretty bleak. Uh, it's all a hilly country, so it'd be very hard to, to uh, plant crops. And because of the prisoners, I suppose, that if you planted something, they'd steal it from you in the first place. But here was John on the Isle of Patmos, a political prisoner because he was outspoken about his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, Patmos is about 63 miles off the coast of Ephesus. And so nobody's gonna 
uh, leave the island and swim out of that place. He was captive. He was there for years. But, you know, we read something really fascinating in, in chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. And uh, I've written the scripture for you so you can, you can look and see for yourself. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. He was a political prisoner because of the word of God and because of his testimony concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. But the most amazing thing to me in this passage is found in verse 10, where John wrote this. He said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. In the spirit on the Lord's day. You know, regardless of our circumstances or where we are, poverty or sickness or whatever may be going on, um, that's a good place to worship the Lord. And it would appear that John, on the Lord's day, would take time to just lift his heart and his hands to the Lord in worship and adoration. And you know, it was uh, in this place, the Isle of Patmos, as he worshiped the Lord, that, that Jesus revealed himself to the Apostle John. And what John saw was not just the resurrected Lord, he saw the glorified Lord. And uh, his description is given in chapter 1. You need to take some time and read that. When most people think of the book of Revelation, they think of, well, they think of warfare and bloodshed, death, and destruction. But I have to tell you that the, the revelation of Christ is so much more. It's truly a revealing of his eternal glory. Uh, but there's more to that book. It's a revelation also of the wickedness of man. We're going to see that the first three and a half years of the tribulation is a time of man's wrath, what man does to man. It's not God's wrath, it's man's wrath. Um, but, you know, the encouraging thing about this book, there are some good things that happen in Revelation. And one of the, the best things that happens is the final eviction of Satan and his evil kingdom, his demonic spirits, they're going to be evicted from earth and from God's holy presence. I have to say amen to that. I like that word eviction. Uh, you think of an eviction notice. Um, well, Satan and his evil kingdom are going to be evicted. They're going to be thrown out, not only from the presence of God in, in glory or in heaven, Right now, he's the accuser of the brethren. He goes before the Lord, and he mocks us and mocks the Lord. But he's going to be evicted from heaven and from planet Earth. I've heard lots of horror stories about uh, people that have rented out properties, and uh, sometimes the properties are not taken care of, and they have to evict these people. Other times, they get far behind on their rent, and... and, and uh, and so the landowner can't make his own payments on the property. He has to evict them. And there are horror stories about eviction. Uh, people become angry and they tear off the, uh, the doors of the cabinets, the bathrooms and the kitchen, leave a mess, uh, rub animal feces into the carpet, break the plumbing, cut the, cut the electrical wiring, kick holes in the wall. <laughs> Well, that's an eviction notice that uh, prompts that sometimes. And that's exactly what Satan is going to do when he knows that his time is short. Uh, he's being evicted. He knows that. And so he's going to go about in all his wrath to destroy everything good, everything that God has created, including planet Earth, but especially people that are created in the image and the likeness of God. Uh, so this time of man's wrath is, is, uh, is the first half of the tribulation. And man is going to do some evil things prompted by Satan. We read in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, 
Revelation, by the way, uh, means uh, apocalypse, uh, the Greek word apocalypsis, but it means the unveiling. It means the revealing of things that were previously in darkness or things that were hidden. So this is a revelation. Apocalypse means revealing, unveiling. So revelation is the name of the book, but it's also the purpose of the book. God wants us to know things coming in the future, and he wants us to see uh, the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. So in this book, starting in chapter 1, he gives us the unveiling of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. I would just want to go uh, through a couple of these things and, and show them to you. And by the way, the, the glory of the Lord, again, was not just his resurrected body, but it was, it was the glorified Savior. And we read in verse 4, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, grace be unto you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come. The Lord Jesus Christ is the eternal God, past, present, future. And he describes himself, uh, the God who is and was and is to come. Verse 5, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead. When the Lord Jesus came, uh, he said, as he prayed, not my will, but thine be done. And he came to reveal the glory of the Father. And you read about that in John chapter 1. But he's the first begotten of the dead. Thank God for the resurrection. Uh, he's the one who said, because I live, you shall live also. If you've placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have uh, a, a blessed eternal future awaiting you. Because he lives, we shall live also. But he's also presented as the prince of the kings of the earth. He is Lord. And in verse 7, interesting, he says, Behold, he will come with clouds. I don't think that these are clouds that are floating around in our, our world today. I believe that they're clouds of believers. Remember that when Jesus comes in power and great glory, this is not the rapture, this is the revelation of Christ. Uh, the saints will come with him. And the armies of heaven riding upon white horses robed with a clean white linen and so forth. Um, I think there's going to be clouds multiplied, millions of believers and angelic beings that the Lord has created. That the scripture says that every eye shall see him. Um, TV? I don't know, maybe. Uh, however, uh, he doesn't need TV for every eye to look up and see him. He's able to take care of that. But even those who pierce him, those who have died, those who are, are waiting for their final judgment, they're going to look up and see the coming of the glory of the Lord. Uh, it's a fantastic thing when you think of him coming in power and great glory in the clouds. Jesus said in verse 8, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. Jesus, in our, in our uh, if you think about our language, he's everything from A to Z. Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the ending, the one who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. The word Almighty is a pretty interesting word. Uh, it means... Uh, simply that God is sovereign. The Lord Jesus is the ruler. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he's going to come in power and great glory. Well, in verse 12, John reported this. He said, I saw seven golden lampstands. Those lampstands, by the way, were the seven churches. I think they're, um, they're listed for us, beginning with Ephesus and and Smyrna, and going all the way through Laodicea. But those seven churches, we'll talk about those in, uh, in, in a few sessions. Uh, very important because they're messages to us. And I think that they give us an outline from the, from the first century uh, right up through the time of the Protestant Re Reformation and through the time of great revival, the Church of Philadelphia, and then Laodicea is 
the last church. It's a church that's, Luke's, that's lukewarm. It's lost its message. It's lost its, its zeal for winning the lost. But Jesus is standing amongst the churches. He knows what's going on. He's, he's here in our midst, wherever two or three are, are gathered in his name. He's there. But he, uh, John said, I saw the seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man. He looked like Jesus. John recognized him, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girded about the chest with a golden girdle. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire, and his feet like fine bronze, as if they burned in a furnace. I believe that uh, the feet of, of bronze like that is speaking of the God of all judgment, and he, he is righteous in his judgment. You need to understand that. I tell you, there are a lot of things I don't understand. You know, I, I sometimes wonder, what about those who have never heard the gospel? They've never perhaps had a, in fact, they haven't, they haven't, they've never heard that God loves them and died on the cross for them. What about these? Well, the only answer I have is that the Lord is righteous and uh, his judgment will be righteous. What he does will be right. You don't have to wonder or question. He is righteous. Uh, his voice like the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars. That's the messengers uh, to those seven churches, the pastors. I believe he has pastors in his hands today. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, which is the word of God. And listen to this. His countenance was as the sun shining in all its strength. Wow, the glorified Lord. And when John saw him, even though he recognized him, Scripture says, I fell at, at his feet as if I were dead. He didn't just put his hands in his pocket and, and slander up to, uh, to the Lord Jesus. Uh, no, he fell before him in worship and awe, and in his case, in fear. But the Lord laid his right hand upon John and said to him, Fear not. Isn't that wonderful? I believe that when we see the Lord, we're going to fall before him and worship in awe of who he is, what he's done, redeeming us. But he says to us, fear not. For believers, the Lord Jesus is to be greatly revered, not feared. But if you don't know the Lord is your Savior, you have every reason to fear the Lord, the Lord of judgment, the Lord who will eventually cast those who, who refuse to believe in him into a terrible, eternal lake of fire. And Jesus said, fear not, I'm the first and I'm the last. I am he that lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and death. You know, if, if you listen enough to talk radio and see the things that are, are presented on Fox News or whatever you listen to, you might think, man, this world is out of control. Well, it is. And Satan is called the, uh, the prince of the air, the prince of the power of the air, and he's the ruler of this world. But I want you to know that in this hellish world, uh, God is still in control. Satan only can do what the Lord allows him to do. Jesus is on the throne. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. And uh, we need to realize that Satan is not in full control. He'd like you to think he is, but he is not. And he will have a final, a final end. His word will not be the last word. Satan's days are numbered. He knows that. And he will go forth in a fury, and he's going to uh, cause all the havoc that he can, the time of tribulation. But remember that Jesus is Lord, King of kings, Lord of lords. Well, not only do you see in the book of Revelation the glory of the Lord, but you also see the unveiling of future events. So in that first verse in the Bible, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his bondservants things which must shortly or quickly come to pass. 
Uh, the things that are coming to pass are not necessarily soon. It's been 2,000 years since this was written. But they're going to happen very quickly. Things which must shortly come to pass. And uh, so I've made a little bit of an outline, and I hope this will help unscramble some of the confusion about the book of Revelation. Uh, I think it's important to look for the, the action chapters, uh, things that are happening. Now, there are a lot of parentheses, and they're, they're like a pause in the action, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. But the first thing to happen after the churches of chapter 2 and 3, you find in, in chapter 4, verse 1, the words come up here. And I believe that that is, uh, of course, that was the command for John to go into the presence of the Lord. He was transported to heaven, just wasn't just a vision. He was taken, and he saw future things. But I believe that's a picture of the rapture. And from this verse, chapter 4, verse 1, all the way through chapter 20, you don't read about the bride of Christ anymore. You, you read about tribulation saints, but that's not the bride of Christ. The rapture happens for Jew and Gentiles who have believed in Christ from the day of Pentecost until the day that he takes us to glory. And uh, we look forward to that day. It's a day of blessed hope. Uh, but after the rapture, uh, you go to chapter 6 and you find a seven-sealed scroll. Sometimes people have a, a picture of a scroll, something that's rolled up with seven uh, seals on it. But I don't believe that that's an accurate picture. I believe that that... Uh, that scroll was rolled up, had one seal that could be opened. You could open that portion, and then you could read in, in that portion. And afterwards, you could open the second seal and read that portion. And I believe that the, uh, the seven-sealed scroll found in Revelation chapter 6 is the key to the book of Revelation. It speaks of sequence, one thing right after another. Um, and, of course, as you open those seals, the Lord Jesus came, and he he's, will come, and he'll open those seals. And the things that are revealed are overwhelming, in all honesty. Uh, the first four seals, uh, you'll find that there were riders on four different horses. Uh, the first one was a rider on a white horse. And it would appear that there's coming one called the Antichrist, who's going to... He's going to create a world government. By the way, that world government will control everybody on earth. And if you don't have his mark on your forehead or, or on your hand, you can't buy or sell. Uh, it's going to be a time of uh, not real peace. It'd be a time of, of unbelievable control. And it seems like there are government actions, even today, uh, headed toward a, 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 a ten world government government, a single government, and uh, our hearts can, can, can be uh, overwhelmed when we see the things that they have planned for controlling mankind. But it isn't just a time of, of nice peace on earth. The second horse rider was on a red horse, and it speaks of anarchy and bloodshed, it speaks of war. People are going to rebel. It's going to be a time of terrible bloodshed. A third uh, rider was on a black horse, and he held in his hand a set of scales. It speaks of food shortages, rationing. Uh, it speaks of a time of starvation and death. Uh, that's, the, uh, that's the third seal, the rider on a black horse. Uh, but the one that really grabs your attention is the fourth one. Uh, that rider was on a pale horse, and his name was Death. And it will be by undoubtedly by disease, starvation, bloodshed, and uh, even the beasts of the earth are going to turn against mankind. And, uh, and those are the first four seals. There's a, and by the way, I, I refer to that. I believe that's a time of man's wrath. It's not God's wrath. This is a time where Satan pours out his wrath and man does his bidding and the destruction that's found, I believe, also including nuclear war, is going to be a time of man, man's wrath. And I believe that, uh, I believe that uh, 25 percent of 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 the uh, human race is going to be killed at that time. 
8 billion people, 25% is 2 billion people, are going to lose their lives. Later in Revelation, another third, and uh, together they're half the population of planet Earth are going to be, are going to be terribly destroyed. Uh, but there's a fifth seal that's also part of this time of man's wrath, and uh, we read about that uh, in, the, in the sixth chapter in verse 9. Chapter 6, verse 9. And when he had opened the, uh, the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which, which they held. It's a time of uh, man's wrath that we would refer to as martyrdom. And you wonder, how are they going to be slain? Well, chapter 20 and verse 4 even gives us description of that terrible bloodshed and, and martyrdom. And we read in chapter 20 and verse four, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and who had not worshiped the beast, neither his image, neither had they received his mark upon their foreheads and in their hands, but they're beheaded for the witness of Jesus. That would make me think of a terrible sword, possibly the sword of Islam. Uh, Islam wants to control the world, and their desire is to is to uh, is to cut off the head of every person that doesn't agree with them. Uh, there's a lot of that type of thing going on in different countries now. Uh, believers, women that don't uh, dress to their liking and they simply cut off their head. I think that that's, I think Islam's gonna have a, a major part of the, of the time of tribulation. But you start with a rapture in chapter four, verse one, and the next action is uh, the opening of the, of the seven seals in chapter six. Uh, and then um, in chapter, uh, chapters eight and nine, you find that there's the blowing of seven trumpets. This now is the wrath of God. This is not the wrath of man any longer. We believe this is the beginning of the second half of the tribulation. Um, but you know, I, I find great encouragement. I, I talked about a good thing that's happening in the, in the tribulation is the eviction of Satan. Yes, he's kicking holes in the wall and he's not leaving without without uh, doing all that he can to destroy the works of God. But the second thing that's wonderful that's going to happen is, is the greatest revival of human history. I tell you, I pray for revival. I pray for revival in the United States of America. There's wonderful things, I understand, happening in the third world. Many people coming to Christ. You know, those people live in poverty and, and they have no hope until they hear about Jesus. Well, here in America, we have false hope. You know, as long as I got money and gas in my, in my car, my new car, have a nice place to live, everything's fine, I don't need God. Uh, it may take a time of terrible testing before uh, people begin to turn to the Lord. But during the tribulation, uh, the greatest revival of, of all time, um, the scripture says in chapter seven, a multitude that no man can number will wash their robes in the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. Uh, well, in between the action chapters are these parentheses uh, or interludes, like a pause in the action. And you know what I'm talking about. People will take a, uh, their TV remote and they can pause a video, go get some popcorn and come back and, and continue. But uh, a pause in the action. Chapters four and five, after after John talks about come up here and the rapture, it's like he's so excited about what he's seen in heaven that he pauses the action. And for two chapters, he tells us the glory of heaven. And then after chapter six, there's another pause in the action. Uh, chapter seven is a revelation of this tremendous revival that's gonna happen worldwide. And uh, if you can, if you can identify these, these times where there's a pause in the action and, and follow the action chapters, chapter four, six, eight, and nine, and so forth, uh, you begin to unravel some of the mysteries of, 
of the book of Revelation. Well, then you jump up to uh, uh, chapter 16. Uh, by the way, when the Lord, uh, when his servant blows the seventh trumpet, it is, it is now the outpouring of seven bowls. It's like bowls of poisoning, only uh, bowls of God's wrath are going to be poured out. And we read about that in, in chapter 16. And, uh, and after that, of course, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in power and great glory. Every eye shall see him. He'll come in clouds. Uh, the battle of Armageddon will take place. Uh, but after that, and by the way, during that time of God's wrath is the eviction of all evil. Satan and, and his, his wicked demons are going to be cast out. Hallelujah. They're going to be gone. He's going to evict them. And after, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ comes in power and great glory, there's a thousand years of, of peace. Uh, Satan will be released for just a short time. It's going to cause rebellion all over again. It's just, it's almost like proof that if, if God doesn't eliminate Satan and cast him away, maybe some kind of a time warp, I don't know. But if Satan is allowed to live throughout eternity in the presence of God, there would never be an end to the evil that we have. And for those that think that God might be unjust in, in judging and, and casting Satan and his demons into the lake of fire, uh, he's not at all unrighteous. It has to happen. But eventually there's coming a new heaven, a new earth, and the new Jerusalem is going to descend from heaven. It's 1,500 miles square and 1,500 miles high. And I joke about that, and I say, you know, it's a city, four square. Uh, maybe there's about three miles in between. That'd be 500 different levels. Uh, maybe they all have Pikes Peak on each level and, uh, and beautiful streams and forests. Um, don't know. Uh, I has not seen, nor has it entered the mind of man, what God has prepared for them that love him. But the Lord is going to come, establish his kingdom. And he's going to make all things new. Now, after uh, the beginning of God's wrath, uh, you go from chapters 8 and 9 where the, the trumpets are blown uh, up to chapter 16 where the seven bowls are poured out, will be a number of chapters, again, that are the pause button. And uh, the Lord is going to show us some incredible things, including, including two witnesses from the Old Testament. We'll talk about that in a couple of weeks or a couple a couple more sessions. God is going to call Israel back to himself. Moses and Elijah are going to be here doing great miracles. And uh, there's many other things that are taking place uh, during the time of pause when he's giving us an interlude and showing us the details of what will happen. And there's an interlude also uh, before chapter 19 and another one before chapters 21 and 22. I hope that gives you a little idea uh, we're looking, at, as far as action things, the rapture, the time of man's wrath, the opening of the seven seals in chapter 6, uh, God's wrath beginning with uh, chapter 8 and the blowing of the seven trumpets, and more of God's wrath with the seven bowls that are poured out, finally Jesus returning and establishing not just a thousand-year uh, kingdom or, re or a millennial kingdom, but He's going to make all things new. So if you can follow the action, that kind of gives you a sequence of how things are working out. The general outline of Revelation is really quite simple. And he gives it to us in Revelation chapter 1 and, and verse 19. Write the things which you have seen. Uh, by the way, that's the things that are past. Chapter 1, the things that John saw. He saw the risen and the glorified Savior, you saw the Lord Jesus Christ in all his glory. Write the things that you have seen and the things which are, that is, present. And I believe that's chapters 2 and 3, the seven churches of Revelation. And we're going to take time with each of those churches. They're an important, vitally important message for us today. And then, of course, uh, also write the things which shall be hereafter, the future, chapters 4 to 22. Christ evicting Satan from, from planet Earth and from his glorious kingdom, uh, the terrible things of the tribulation, uh, those things are, 
all laid out, past, present, future. I tell you, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have everything to look forward to, despite the things going on in our world. Um, I would encourage you not to spend too much time listening to talk radio. Uh, you can get a very negative perspective. You know, the world's falling apart. There's no hope. Uh, I'm finding that the more I see what's going on, the more I need the Word of God and to be in fellowship with the Spirit of God, to be looking for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's coming, and that's our hope. Um, I'm so thankful for this wonderful book of Revelation. In our next session, we're going to deal a little more with the sequence of events. Uh, there's some things that we can go through pretty quickly where it gives you that general idea of the sequence of what's going on. It's a wonderful book, and it's not meant to bring terror to your heart, but, but to bring blessing and, and encouragement. Just remember that Jesus is Lord. He's coming. Uh, Lord, I want to thank you today for our friends that have joined us in this wonderful study, the book of Revelation. Lord, I thank you that as we come to you with a hungry heart, uh, you open our eyes and our hearts to see things that otherwise we just wouldn't see. I thank you that you are King of kings and Lord of lords, our hope. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, we long for your coming. And I pray that meanwhile, we that know you as Savior can be faithful in getting the gospel out to people who so desperately need to have hope. We thank you for your goodness. Thank you for our time together today in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, you may want to contact us sometime, and uh, I put my uh, email address for you there, discoverynews1 at aol.com. You may have questions or comments, and if there's anything that we can do to be an encouragement to you, you may have questions about your relationship to God and how to really be assured that you have eternal life. So don't hesitate to uh, email us. We'll try to contact you back. We also have put out a uh, website at www.discovery.global. All sorts of uh, articles there, information about creation, dinosaurs, future events, etc. I uh, think that you would enjoy that. And uh, we, we have done other videos, and if you're interested in some of those videos, you can find them, a list of them, at Discovery News Chuck Anderson on YouTube. Chuck Anderson, Discovery News, Chuck Anderson on YouTube. Um, six months ago, I put out a, a video entitled, What Does the Bible Say About Russia and Nuclear War? And I was shocked when 263,000 people saw that video. And uh, there's a lot of interest, a lot of concern. What's going on in this world? But if you're interested in things like that, you can find them listed there at Discovery News, Chuck Anderson on YouTube. Hope to see you again soon. We'll try to put one of these out on, on YouTube once a, once a week. And if you'd like to have information about that, you can subscribe to us on, uh, I think on, on Facebook, you can subscribe and be taken right into it. But uh, it's, it's a privilege to study the Word of God together, and I'm glad you joined us today. God bless you.